Welcome out, everybody. I'm going to put everybody on screen here in just one second. The great band, the White Stripes. Seven Nation Army. 
All right, folks, here we go. Let me just get all this set up. I want to give you guys a really cool intro. All right, bam, there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome out to another episode of Decode Your Reality. I have a very, very special guest with me today. I have Jason from Archaics joining me. Jason, welcome out to this special uh, podcast on the simulation theory, the simulacrum, as you like to call it. We have a lot of amazing decoders and syncretists in the audience. Uh, hopefully, we'll get this uh, viewer uh, a little bit higher here. But uh, welcome out, everybody, all you great decoders around the world, wherever you are, uh, you great syncretists, conspiracy buffs, chronologists, et cetera, et cetera, historians. Um, my name is Logan, of course, from Decode Reality, Jason from Archaics, and I'm wearing my sunglasses, of course, because I'm representing the simulation. That's, to me, what these sunglasses mean, so I'm just going to keep these on for fun. Uh, so, Jason, man, so great to join in, man. I was so enamored when, um, when I got to join with you with the Syncretism Society um, just not too long ago, and man, um, I just have been finding so many nuggets with your work and just chop and shop with you um, during our, uh, our our podcast with Santos and company it was quite amazing. So, um, so so great to have you here, brother. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I seem to be on a delay. Is that just my? Is that just me? You might be a delay. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Okay. This... It's, it's not. A, it's not an audio delay, so it doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, you should be good to go. But uh, before I start, I, before I give you the floor and let you start dumping all this great wisdom in front of everybody and telling everybody <laughs> about your awesomeness and stuff like that, I wanted to show you um, something that I found through decoding you as a person to show like the decoders in my, you know, my world, just how powerful you are and how you're tied to the great pyramid of Giza. I'm going to wow you with this information. You won't be able to see it unless you're on YouTube and watching the actual presentation that we're doing right now. But let me just show all the viewers really quickly. Jason, maybe you could just log on to YouTube and if you're watching it, you'll see this, but I want to show everybody the power in this methodology and how alchemy tying to the great pyramid of Giza, tying to Neo, the one that comes to show you how this reality works tied to mathematics. So Jason Matthew Brashears is the name that he goes by, of course. And this name is the name that he, his last name was changed when he was five. But this is his full name that he goes by. And notice it's a number 74 in the numerology. And that, if you just follow it down, the 74 is leading to this element called tungsten, which is otherwise known as Wolfram. And you'll be happy to know, Jason, that Wolfram's average weight is 183, which is a permutation of that mighty 138 that you talked about. So right off the bat, your name is tied to tungsten, the wolf, and it's tied to this terminology that I've come up with called feed the wolf, which is what we're feeding is the simulation. And this numerology output is the number 60. And then you go into alchemy again, and you get tied to the 60th element called neodymium, which is where Neo from the Matrix was found. And the Royal Society of Chemistry does a great job showing you these icons just below neodymium is the pyramid. And of course, the, the latitude, longitude of the Great Pyramid of Giza is 29 degrees north, 31 degrees east. And when you add those up, you're going to get the number 60. So it's it all just goes right back to your um, to your your name, and then just to show you this last slide, and I'll bring you in here, the 138. You're saying every 138 years the phoenix comes in and everything gets changed. If you break 138 down in alchemy, separating all the numbers, you're going to get hydrogen, lithium, and oxygen. Adding those up, you get 23.943 which 23 is tied to the words pineal and the word movie. Pineal and movie. So there you go, man. 138, man. Tied to Lanthanum and the one that lies hidden, right? So there's so much more to go with that. But just to show you the power, Jason, and how you're the real deal, I know that, and how we are here talking about the simulation theory. So, dude, I'm going to give you the floor. Uh, and let's roll with this, man. What do you got? Dump some Gnosis on us, man. <laughs> That, that's, I mean, that's pretty interesting. I didn't, I didn't intend on, on mentioning this, but you, I was born, I was born 23 degrees north latitude of the equator 
exactly on the exact same line the Great Pyramid was constructed. And I was born in Spring Memorial Hospital, uh, north of Houston. You can't hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm on a delay. It's kind of messing me up. But, yeah, uh, you are on a delay a little bit. I don't know why, but. Yeah, I would, uh, I don't know. It's just, uh, I'm in the opposite hemisphere. Well, no matter what your paradigm of the world is, I'm still on the opposite side of the world from, uh, from the Great Pyramid, but I was born there in Spring, Texas, Spring Memorial Hospital. And, uh, it's all, it's, it's 20, it's 29 degrees North latitude, exactly the same location as the Great Pyramid in the opposite hemisphere. It's crazy. Do, but, uh, do you, do you think that, do you think that that pyramid has like everything to do with this reality and it's actually creating this simulation in some way, shape okay. or form? No, I'm glad you asked that. And, and, I, and I'm also, you know, from my, when, when you interviewed me on Syncretism Society, I had made a request. I know you remember this. I didn't want to know any of the questions you guys asked me. It's all, there's a reason for that. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a profound dynamic operative between two minds when they're communicating as long as they don't pre-plan anything and you just go with the flow. We're actually learned. We're actually led by a third dynamic, something that is beyond you and I. And uh, I've learned this a long time ago that I just don't want to plan any dialogues. I don't want to plan. I just want to freestyle. And this is what, why a lot of my videos are freestyle. Uh, my, my most popular videos right now are my van vlogs because people know for a fact, as I'm in my van, I'm not resorting to notes. I'm not resorting to script. I can't, I'll die. I'm driving. So, uh, I, and my mind is also free because I'm mechanically mechanistically, my body's going through the motions of survival in that van, but there's a whole nother periphery that I'm tapping into and I'm drawing all this information. I'm able to, to basically teach things from an inner me. Uh, as opposed to just a brainiac, Jason. Yeah. So you asked me this question right now, and, and uh, it, I don't know, it's just, I have problems with a lot of other researchers on the Great Pyramid, and I know some authors that have reached out to me, and one guy who goes to the Great Pyramid of Giza, and he knows he knows Zawi Havas personally, I know he's really frustrated with me right now. We have exchanged emails and a lot of dialogues, because I am not, he has his own YouTube channel, and a few of them do. But I am not moved by none of their discoveries when they find when they find these physics constants in the Great Pyramid, because I have already told these authors what they're finding. When you find repetitions of pi, fractals of phi, and then regular phi, 1.618, 1, uh, 1 you find these all throughout the holographic template of measurements in the rectilinear dimensions of the Great Pyramid. I have told these guys over and over and over to quit focusing on the physics because that was absolutely necessary for whoever the architect was to implant that secret 138 periodicity protocol that was embedded in the period for which I have never seen anyone ever published before. But uh -huh. uh, the measurements don't lie. Sir Flinders Petrie's measurements are still, are still accepted by Scientifica today. They're still accepted by Egyptologists. Zawi Hawass quotes Sir, Sir Flinders Petrie. It's because he's the only scientist that ever went in the monument and measured every rectilinear line to the thousandths of an inch. So we go by his measurements and I go by his measurements. And when I did, I found out that the number 138 is, is found encoded in hundreds of measurements. And it's not just a, a light claim. I have YouTube videos that show those hundreds of times, show exactly where they are. So I don't know why I'm the one that found it from a prison cell, but it wasn't something I was looking for. I was actually researching world history. Oh, uh, my, 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 my observations about informed fields and how we how we be pretty much introduce the coding of the reality that we want to experience and then we live it and it knits for us just days before we experience something that holography is being knit by us as long as long as we're moving in that direction. None of this was my none of this was my intention. I had no intention of teaching these things. My only intention was to basically divulge the things I had found because principally. I'm a chronologist. It's all I've ever claimed to be was a chronologist. In fact, that claim even extends to the fact that I have challenged all the famous and, and uh, all the multimillionaire authors who have put out all this garbage history. I have called them out in emails, in letters, on YouTube. I have called them out. It's That's how confident I am in my research. I did not know that other people such as yourself was going to find value in all these type of this type of research. This never dawned on me. It was never my intent. To do, to do that. I just wanted to be, I just wanted to contribute to academia, even though academia will never accept me as a brethren. It will never happen. 
not just because I'm not educated in the holes that they've been educated in, but possibly they may find offense in the fact that I'm probably more educated than they are because I had access to materials and the time to actually go through them and think and process this information while they were living their lives and going on dates and, and going to the movies and taking their kids out, raising families. And I mean, that's a, that takes a lot of time out of your day. But if you're researching things for 16 to hour, 16 to 18 hours a day, sleeping and doing it all again the next day and drawing your discoveries and, and charts and timelines and sending them all home as soon as you can't carry them anymore and doing it all over again, you know, I was in prison 26 years, which is a very long time. Didn't feel like 26 years to me, but still it was. But for 19 of those years, I was very serious in my education. So serious, in fact, that I had, I had pretty much exploded on people violently for interrupting that research. I mean, people learned real quick, if I'm in the day room reading a book, stay the hell away from me. <laughs> and I had developed this policy, and people respected it. Some, some respected it because they saw that I was trying to do something. Others respected it because they didn't want to get hit in the mouth. I've never been scared of taking an ass whooping. I will if it's going to get me to that last chapter. Right. That's interesting, man. I mean, the whole concept of what you did in there, uh, 26 years is a long time. That, that number itself is very interesting because it's tied to the element iron, which is in our blood. And I mean, it's tied to the tetragrammaton, which somehow, some way, some shape or form is tied to the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, I just don't, I haven't, it's, there's so many moving parts to this whole damn thing. And it obviously, when you really go down the deep rabbit holes that, you know, a lot of us have gone down, when you get down here to these holes, you realize like, oh man, I have all these toys to play with. And it was just so much more simpler with just one or two toys to play with. But when you start to play with all these moving parts, you realize that it really gets complicated. And then, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot more research to do when you get to these, you know, deeper, deeper levels. I'm just a huge fan of numbers, man. So let's, let's jump into this. 138. Let's see if we can kind of crack a little bit of the code live here for all the audience that is uh, that is watching. What can you what can you tell me about the 138? Well, first, I'm going to tell you something profound. You're you're probably going to hit me up with something I've never heard before. But but uh, first of all, when I put all this thesis together, I didn't know that the events that I was isolating to the side that were so anomalous were 138 years apart, or 276, 414 years, 552 years, 690 mm -hmm. years. All of those are multiples of 138. I didn't know that all these epic events that have been noticed in history and recorded and, and preserved on monuments and stelae and parchment in ancient Greek texts and mentioned in, by Pliny the Elder and Aristarchus and Eratosthenes and Ovid and Hesiod and all these fantastic events when i had this timeline put together i was reading the jewish haggadah text and in that text i was just going through it because i really not i really don't like the talmud i really don't like the way they rewrote history but there is value to be found in anything especially when scholars are trying to conceal facts they'll often throw a bone in the text and this is very popular you know two thousand years ago especially post-alexandrian times they threw bones in texts that would, would refer you to an entirely another text. These colophons are hidden in many ancient writings. One of them that I found was a Jewish reference in the Haggadah that said every 138 years, the angel of death visits the earth. As soon as I read that, this entire timeline jumped <laughs> off. I got my calculator out. And in about a 24-hour period, yeah. I pulled my old prison typewriter out. I went through bags of research, and I retyped the entire history of the world in 138-year intervals because I wanted to know exactly what – I wasn't curious about what happened every 138 years. That didn't matter to me anymore because I already discovered that. I was now wanting to know what the hell happened in between each one of those 130-year-old episodes. That's when I discovered things for which I didn't even know that the outside world – because I was in prison. I didn't know the outside world already had words for these. I didn't know they knew that, that people were already talking about mud floods. I didn't know that people were already talking about liquefaction. I didn't know any pe people were talking about flux tube activity, which are giant electrical plasma bolts that are coming from the sky, blowing up fortifications and, and ancient civilizations and cities, wh which archaeologists have found. I mean, I have so much archaeological data from like the source book project and they, you know, sources most people don't even realize how many archaeologists have published materials that never made it into mainstream. And I've always, I've always got my hands on that material, and I just data mined it. 
and I put this huge synthesis together, but uh, it was that it was that one reference. So it links in the Jewish mind. It linked a 138 year period to something appearing in the sky because in, 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 it, in the Jewish tradition, it was that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed in the 138th year when uh, uh, since the angel of death had been seen. So every 138 years, it's gets seen. This in this incident in the Haggadah, it was the total destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Interesting. Well, that, I mean, that 138 for me. I mean, in me in the decoding world is big because as I showed with just breaking the one, three, and eight up into alchemy. But the number 138 is found in the elements uh, barium and lanthanum and lanthanum owns the 138 as its average lanthanum is the 57th element which is tied to lucifer lucifer is somehow some way involved in this whole concept of the simulation of course the light bringer um and there's so many ways to connect lucifer and this simulation that we're all playing out i mean the longest running soap opera is called guiding light and that is uh, a total yeah. numerology of 39, which is linked to Lucifer in its original spelling. And it goes back to the Lightbringer. So there's, there's something with this whole thing and Lucifer and the Lightbringer. And then you get the Christ in there. And they're, it seems like they're all in cahoots together, right? Maybe the same thing and just broken apart in different stories or something like well, that. Well, Logan, if, if I was, let's, let's, just, let's just say that I'm Artificial Intelligence X. I am the main personality protocol that governs everything within this reality. And I have 7 billion little ethereal sparks that all have their own personalities. I have to govern and try to corral them into reality tunnels. If I was AIX, if I was going to guarantee the, a, a maintenance of control over the masses, then I would be in control of both antipodes. I would be in control of what was perceived as good and what is perceived yep. as evil and everything in between. Agreed. Agreed. I, I totally concur. I, I've come to the conclusion that we live inside of a self-contained system. We're all little cells in it. We're all little cells and we feed the battery, which is the wolf. And it's all tied to, you know, this, the, the whole aspect of light, the speed of light, the speed of light being the measurement that's embedded into the great pyramid of Giza's latitude, longitude. These are not coincidences. This is all perfect symmetrical numbering patterns that are freaking precise. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I putting this out here, um, uh, advertising this podcast, I'm getting a host of people, uh, you know, really not fundamentally getting the concept. Like, what do you mean we live in a simulation? You know, what, what do you, what do you mean by that? You know, I get that a lot. Yeah, and you get that a lot too, right? And I mean, that's why I'm wearing the sunglasses because the sunglasses, to me, told the story. I mean, you got Neo, if you, the Terminator, they're all wearing the sunglasses. And then the big movie yep. in 2022 came out, which was called Free Guy. And he puts the glasses on and he realizes, hey, wait a minute, I'm in a freaking movie, right? And you then- remember, You remember the movie, They Live from the course, 80s? Oh, I broke, I decoded it, Take man. Roddy Piper, man. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Look, simulation. Simulation is a turnoff for a lot of people. And I explained in another podcast with, with, with another host that people often leave my channel. They'll leave for two or three months. I get emails, and I know one girl's listening right now. I'm not going to say her name. I just saw her name in the chat. But she fully admitted she left the channel for like six months because people hit this wall of cognitive dissonance. It's yeah. not what they're prepared to absorb. It doesn't fit with all their prior, their prior paradigms. So they go through a shedding period yep. and it's nothing I can force. I can provide the data and all I'm doing is planting a seed. So that person begins to shed. They leave for months and then things that happen in their daily life start making sense because they're processing information through different filters. Those seeds actually took root. Then they find themselves back in on the archaics channel, apologizing in the comments. They just say, man, you know what? I watched this video five months ago and I called you everything but a child of God. I'm glad you didn't block <laughs> me from your channel. So you know, people hit this wall, but simulation theory is far more complex than a video game. Totally. Where, I mean, I tried to, I tried to explain it in a podcast yesterday in quantum principles because there's really nothing physical about this. I mean, anything that you magnify, you already know, there's more open spaces between material objects than there are. Everything everything under an electron microscope becomes oscillating fields. That's Everything. Right. The more you magnify. So if there's really, in essence, nothing there, then how far is it a departure from, from cognition to admit, okay, we're living a simulation. My, my central nervous system isn't going to let me uh, feel that. 
but I have so I have an aspect of my personality that is very different than the physical world around me or the non-physical. And that's the ability to imagine something. And this is something animals cannot do. It's what makes it's a, it's one of the fundamentals that make us very different from the animal kingdom. Imagination is very powerful. We don't just build things, we, we discover things. We learn truth from fiction through imagination. Imagination is a great teacher, just like empathy is a great teacher, just like intuition is the predecessor of knowledge. These three traits are what make us immortal spiritual beings. And when you use those three traits in tandem in your daily life, you can't help but notice how when you step out in the morning at 830 in the morning, the sun's at 15 degree angle in the sky. You step out and you take a, a, a breath of air. You can't tell me it doesn't feel like you're in an artificial world watching butterflies fly around. The air is just enough oxygen for you to fill your fill your lungs. The temperature is just perfect for you for you to walk outside and enjoy yourself. In the mornings and in the evenings is when we have this this detachment, this surreal. It, things become more surreal during the middle of the day. The the weight of the day itself is very heavy on our souls, and we feel like we're immersed in a material world. Yeah. But it's not like that early in the morning and early in the evening. That's when we become more spiritual than we are material. And if you pay attention to the world around you, you're going to start seeing evidence that this has all been presented to you. It's not what you're really experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. I mean, I've done enough research. Many other decoders in my, uh, you know, in my groups have done enough research to show that we're living in a predestined script and you're just along for the ride. And I feel that the best thing anybody could do is figure out what you're, what you're supposed to be doing here other than you know, taking up space and, and, and letting things go through you, such as food and water and experiences. Um, but you know, really, I think it's all about influence. Uh, I, I, you know, Jordan over at Waters Above Crypto, I don't know if you know, he's a great friend of mine. We t we've had a t uh, two podcasts on influence and realizing that, you know, you said imagination is so important. And the, the word imagination in numerology is 30 freaking three, man. And that's where what? the Mason, yeah. And that's where the Mason, the what? G, the capital G is the 33rd capital letter in Francis Bacon numerology. So that's exactly what the square and compass means. It means using your imagination. However, most do people that. don't want to do that. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah, man. It's it, it's really heavy, dude. I mean, it's it's just numerology is perfect to tie into the numbers and prime numbers and sine and cosine waves, mathematical precision. It's just, it's all there. It's just, um, you just got to look for it. And when you, it's like putting a puzzle together. And I just think it's so amazing that, and when you find it, I feel it's very freeing to me. And then I realize, and I tell my audience, I'm like, stop paying attention to the static, which is, you know, the other, simu the other influence going on because you're actually feeding it you know so yeah. it's like you start making your own simulation so to speak really and be a creator most people don't want to do that they're so heavily embedded into the static so right well i'm a i, I have i'm very open-minded to not just the gematria but so i have a lot of listeners that send me emails explaining their di people have different systems by which they interpret reality uh gematria is, gematria is not the only one i've seen some pretty innovative and curious ones i don't have time to really entertain them yeah but the, the deal is, is that we do not live in a world where chaos rules. This is an illusion. The more you analyze the phenomenon, what scientists call chaos, the more you find structure. It's just a different type of structuring. We have a very unique universe uh, that we live in. And because it is almost like an overlay of multiple simulations carrying out so many different timelines simultaneously, we see evidence of cross-contamination. We see this, but we also see the underlying substrate is numbers. And anytime numbers are used to measure any phenomenon, you're going to find patterns. Everything must be patterned. Yep. Now, gematria, to me, is almost as if it's looking at the individual, the coding of this arithmetic. Maybe not the coding of reality itself, but the coding of the underlying arithmetic that builds these thought constructs, these reality tunnels that we experience. So I'm always amazed when I hear that things mean this or things can, can be resolved or because it does add value. I understand. I understand because we live in a coded, coded reality 100 percent. So one of all, this was my chief discovery in, in chronology. And you would think that events are random. You would think that. There is absolutely no way that the same mathematical patterns could, unflow, could, could unfold and be demonstrable to people. You could show actual physical charts that, hey, man, this is exactly how this happened in ancient Rome. But if you look over here, 
across the Mediterranean and Carthage, just take it back 72 years, the exact same history unfolded here. And then if you go back 700 years and put that exact same template on Hittite Anatolia, you'll find that it unfolded just like Akkad did, because you can take that same that same template and go back 400 years in the same series of events on the same years unfolded in ancient Akkad. So these reality tunnel templates, it's almost as if AIX is looking down on history, not from any point of distinction, but from all at the same time in deciding to us, we are looking at a pond of water that's got multiple drops hitting it. And as a drop hits that pond, you see the ripples going outward. Yep. But every single ripple is equidistant from the other side of the wave ring. You yep. follow me? Follow you totally, have, man. Yeah. We have, we have years in history, and my viewers know this already. They know isometric projections. I have beat them up with my isometric projections. But I have many videos, not just explaining this, but showing actual proof throughout history and even in modern times where there are definitive years in our history. I don't know why those years are the way they are, but they're fixed. They're unchangeable. Yep. And you can take events as if that was the drop of water in history before that is an actual reflection of all the events that happened, happened afterwards. It's like forward and backward in time. It is no different than the sequencing that we are told is found in DNA. I can't see DNA, but I know geneticists are, are mystified because they keep publishing reports that the more they study DNA, they find mathematical palindromes. I'm not surprised because we are, in essence, a part of the simulation we perceive. And the simulation we perceive, from what I've seen in ancient history and modern history, is the entire, the entire structuring is in palindromes. So I would be very interested to see somebody do some type of uh, geometrical study to see any, any type of phenomenon using gematria that goes forward and backward in time. I don't know how that would be done because I'm not, I'm not versed in gematria. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot of decoders, including myself. I mean, you know, one of the, Ethan or Kevin or some. I mean, there's some good decoders probably that are going to watch this and they're going to be able to tap into what you're saying. And you know, strength and numbers. We're collabing on this. You know, so let's get into this 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 reset. You're you're saying that in your your research, 2040 is the next Phoenix Rising event. Is that correct? Right. Right. It's it's the next 138 year. Yeah. But but it's not it's not just from the I, that that's not deduced simply simply from the 138 year timeline. Okay. Oh, uh, like I say, I say this a lot. But if something's going to occur, it can be seen from multiple different vantage points. So this is a this is a Mother Shipton has a very harrowing series of prophecies as well. And I'm not talking about the 18th century version where some some British aristocrat in 1830 1835 introduced some some elements in her prophecy that were only applicable to London at the time. There's a forgery of Mother Shipping floating around. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the original 500-year-old prophecies. She wasn't concerned about British history. She was concerned about worldwide history in the in, in the end times. Uh -huh. So there's been some there's been some when I have I have to say that man because because there are scholars who listen to my channel. They're going to listen. They're probably listening to this podcast, and they know for a fact uh, the Mother Shipton text has been compromised. But the area that I'm talking about, basically, uh, the Sky Dragon, the sixth Sky Dragon will return. Well, we're looking about now. We're looking at a window of 2040, and the sixth Sky Dragon conforms to the sixth seal of Revelation, which was the return of the Phoenix. And I have two chapters in my book, When the Sun Darkens, where I explain yep. the seal. Because the Christian interpretations of the seven seals has nothing to do with the ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian versions, and that's all that counts. The, uh, the, the Christian version has, has some really uh, weird interpretations as to what those seven seals being broken actually mean. The symbols to decode all that are actually found in Sumerian and Akkadian texts. They're not found in Christian literature at all. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I love studying the Phoenician stuff, Sumerian. I mean, as far back as you can go, because obviously it's not going to be as watered down per se. But we don't really have it. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. This, But this 2040 is, it, you know, right off, right off the bat, it's 24. It's got the number 24 in it. And the mm -hmm. word wolf, as in feed the wolf, is 24. And 24 is the X chromosome, which is the, the X is the 24th letter in the English alphabet. Right. When you go 138 uh, years prior to 2040, it goes to what, 1902, right? Was the last yeah, one. Uh, before you tell, go on about 1902, though, in northern prophecies spread throughout of 20 to 30 different cultures in northern Europe, 
For over a thousand years, the phoenix was called Fenris. Fenris is the wolf that eats the moon. Yeah, well, there you go. There, there, there you go. I mean, it's all, I mean, th- keep in mind that those of you that are decoders, the word Thomas, I did a decode on Thomas, which is Jesus's twin brother, which is Lucifer. Thomas equals 24. So, I mean, there's so much linked to, to, the, to, the, to Lucifer and it's actually Halil, but it's so many, so much references to this and the Phoenix. Let me ask you, Jason, do you, I had a, I had a guest come on my podcast one night and she brought this up and I had never thought about this, but she, she claimed that the moon was, was once a sun and it burnt out. Right. And I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty deep, man. As simple of a concept that is, that's pretty deep. So, you know, is, are we going to see the burning out of the sun? I feel the sun's on a timer. I feel like it's going to, it's going to go out. I, I mean, that, that the dropping of the sun, maybe, what do you think about that? Oh, um, I've never heard that theory. Uh, I, um, uh, I've read everything by Emmanuel Velikoski, where his source materials were Hans Bellamy. Hans Bellamy's source materials were Hans Borger, an Austrian, a, Vien- a Viennese engineer. These men wrote profound things. They discovered many ancient texts about the pre-Selenites, about races of people during the vapor canopy period when there was essentially whole cultures that admitted that they existed. They, they took pride in the fact that they were pre-Selenites. They were on Earth before the appearance of the moon. And they felt that they were superior to the cultures that came later Uh. that were born after the appearance of the moon. Uh. So uh, I don't know about there's there's nothing that I have ever found in tradition. It's an interesting theory, isn't it? Uh, But I've I've never I've never I've never seen that reflected. What I have what I have found are references to the capture flood or the capture of Luna. Uh, One day we had no moon and we had no moon for thousands of years. And we have cultures in a Neolithic setting, uh, structured in matriarchal societies. And there's just no moon. They were stellar wor- stellar worshiping. Uh, they had star calendars and they built giant dolmens to measure stars. But then one day there was a huge flood and it flooded everywhere. Earthquakes happened. There was all kinds of atmospheric fallout. Rocks fell from the sky. And the next day there was a moon in the sky. And then in and, and the historical records, it's basically called the capture flood. And uh-huh. uh, that that's all I can really tell you about the origin of the moon. One day it was here one, and one day it wasn't. And then, Next thing you know, it was here. Yeah. But when it appeared, it was a huge cataclysm. It was a reset. Whole civilizations were wiped out. When I it bet, with the gravitational pull, perhaps, or however but, that looks. But those traditions are also linked to the fact that a whole new race of people arrived here as if they used it as a way station or a ferry, as if their technology was dying out and they just used what last they had to ferry themselves from the moon, knowing that once they reached the surface of the earth, they was over with. They were here. They're trapped here. Yeah. So there's a lot. Is a lot of this is conjectural and theoretical. It's put together by by hundreds of different traditions. This is this is what a chronologist has to do. We only have pieces and parts of the whole. We have to put this together. And if we can't show the arithmetic, we can't actually claim we found anything. Yeah. This no. is this yeah. is what I do. I mean, well, I mean, I guess I'm a chronologist in some way because as a decoder, you're 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 compiling the my methodology is taking many different layers and putting them together to show right. pictures and you know I use cards and all that. But I like I've I I've, there's no any nobody that can tell me that what I'm showing is is erroneous or it's wrong because I've shown so many patterns of just connecting simple tarot cards and the cards playing cards to new to words that we speak and the alchemy and real science and stuff that's measured in the laboratory, how all this stuff is embedded into one another, how they all play out, and then it's tied into the past, present, and future. It's just it's just all there, and it's just all part of this whole simulation, right? This, this well, reality that's why, that we perceive. That's why you're so open-minded about living in a construct. Yep. It, doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a simulation. We say the word simulation right. only because people identify with that frame of correct, reference. Correct. It could be some, it could be like a sentient biogram. Yep. It could be some living essence around us that responds to us. Well, I don't know, but uh, in response to your original inquiry about 2040, uh, we know 2040 is the exact date and the month of May because of what happened in 1902, which are are basically our scholastic authorities have gone desperately since World War II to bury, conceal to remove those texts, to remove all those references. Even by the 1920s and 30s, when Charles Fort was putting together a really accurate picture of everything that happened in 1902, there was already academic censorship. A full engine of just scrubbing all the histories was in effect, even in his day. And he mentions that in his book of the damned. But 1902 was a harrowing year. I have three different videos about 1902 because those three videos target three 
three totally different phenomena that all happened in 1902. The first video was just the material, just the red dust fall out, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, uh, basically ge geographical reset, really strange astronomical anomalies, uh, the, the appearance of a red star that just hung in space for a while mm -hmm. while all this was going on like a giant projector, and then it disappeared and so did the phenomena. Now, the second video is the socio-political things that did not exist in 1901, but all of a sudden in 1902, there were hundreds of them. They were all over. It's as if, it's as if the programming was reset. A reboot had been initiated. People lived their lives as if nothing, nothing had changed, and yet all these new innovations and new companies and new organizations, new federal branches, all of them just, just, just appeared in 1902. When also quietly, without publishing it, also in 1902, the United States government changed its great seal, which it had since 1783 of the great red phoenix on the back of the American great seal. In 1902, they changed it to the bald eagle. And there's never been a, a sufficient explanation as to why they did that in 1902. But we know the government was run by Masons. Well, so, the, e well the, the, yeah, the, the eagle is, I think astrology comes in and ties its narrative because the eagle is Scorpio, the eighth zodiac sign. And I showed you just a bit ago how the eight is tied to neodymium and the pyramids. And the eight is, You mentioned course, 33 as well. It, you yeah. mentioned 33 as well, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, but Albert Pike in 1884, yep. 1885, published a book, highly controversial. Other Masons were pissed, but he was so high up in the echelons, they couldn't say anything about right. it. But he published Morals and Dogma. Yep. It's huge. It's huge. And it goes, it goes into detail about all the symbol, symbolisms in Freemasonry up to the 32nd degree. Yep. But once you finish the, the 32nd degree, when you turn the page, there's only a flyleaf a cover page for the 33rd degree. And the only thing it says is 33rd degree and it shows the Phoenix. Yeah. Well, that means, this, I mean, think about 33 degrees with water. It turns into a liquid 32. It turns into a solid. So it's a transmutation of state, so to speak in that construct right there with the 32 moving into the 33. How yeah. about this? How about this for a synchronicity? You ready for this one? So today, I'm ready, I'm ready. so every day on the calendar has a, a car. I don't have my cards. Uh, do I have my card deck here? Hang on one second. Every day, oh, I'm not going anywhere. Every, I know you're not. Every day on the calendar, okay? Every day on the calendar, there's a card, the cards of illumination, which is the, the playing cards, okay? And uh, okay. T today is the seven of diamonds card. And, you know, you didn't know this because you're not even into the playing cards, right? Well, the seven of diamonds is the 33rd card in the deck. This one right here is today's <laughs> day, May, May 12th. Really? Yeah, and, wow. and and we're gonna and and there are some people that are watching in England and Europe right now that it's actually the the May thirteenth, and that is the six of diamonds, which is the thirty second card. So we literally are doing a podcast that is encroaching on the thirty three and the thirty two. Wow. Yeah, and so that's it's, what I'm. That, you and I, I, so I, I say f having fun. We're being used. We're being used to deliver this information. Whatever you do with it, ladies, and I'm talking to you, ladies and gentlemen. That's up to you. You got to make the truth no. your own. You can't. No one. There's no force here, right? Right. I know, Jason. Yeah. You're not forcing anything. No. No, uh, I can't be accused of. Uh, I can't be accused of that, especially having kicked so many hundreds of people out of my archaic Facebook group. I I don't deal with negativity. I don't deal with. I I don't respond well to it because I'm not in somebody's physical presence. Yep. Uh, I come I come across digital warriors all the time, and I'm just not going to entertain that crap. So I just I just I just excise them. They're gone. Yep. It's all. Uh, but. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you wouldn't keep a cancer in your life, so why keep, you know, there's a lot of cancers yeah, out there, yeah, man. I just, on the hey, same way. Life is too short. To Life's too short, head. man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from the very beginning, it was, as I started releasing videos, Logan, uh, I have said this in my comment section many times, that because people ask me, say, hey, man, you really do respond to your comments. Sometimes I have long answers. I'll put long answers. In, and because I use YouTube like I used to use Facebook, but. My dialogue with people is never about me and that one personality. I already know that this is going to leave an echo. It's going to leave an imprint. And I know it's going to affect probably somebody totally different who I didn't, who I haven't met or talked to. There are many people, Logan, on your channel who have never left a comment, never left a like. They've never, they're not even subscribed to you. You understand? And they're, but you still affect those people. Yeah. Those people still think about the things they process the information they've learned on your channel. And I'm the same way. There are many, I see my analytics. I see my, my analytics are off the chart. I got 150,000 views. I mean, it's, it's crazy. 
Then I got a little bitty channel. I mean, it's growing up right now. Yeah, you're it's blowing up, man. You you deserve it, man. Yeah. You know, you went from uh, you, you double you doubled after know, Santos is yeah. But I understand what it is. It's uh, people people will have a trouble processing this, and even though they want to comment and even though they want to understand more, they also don't want to put themselves out there because they think they'll be denigrated for stupid or, or or something along those lines. Even though that's not even my character type, I'm patient. But you just have to deal with people with kid gloves. People are fragile. Personalities are fragile. Yeah. So I just, I just, uh, yeah, I'm not the only part. The only people I'm really combative with are those who consider themselves members of academia, but they won't show their face on my channel. And you know what I mean? I, I've, I've been trying to, trying to, trying to get some of them in, but uh, you know, that's, yeah. that's a whole different character type to be in that in that field. Yeah. So, yeah, no, totally. They, 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 Here, so here's another synchronicity, right? So I'm, I'm right now, I don't know if you know who Manly P Hall is, Manly Palmer Hall. Oh yeah. Everybody knows. The Hall. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I'm, I'm decoding him right now and it's, it's, I had, it's, it's pretty much finished, but it's, I'm going to blow the cover off this decode. This one's going to really blow yeah. some people away. So that guy was born in nine. Think about this now with your chronology that you just said, Manly Palmer Hall was born in 1901. The year wow. before, you're saying the reset happened in 1902. Okay, I, I got to stop you right there. I got to stop you right there, okay? I have to, I have to inform you because this is going to add to your add to your statement. I have to inform you that there's a calendrical overlap that makes the last three months of 1901 to actually be 1902. Wow. The only the only the Romans changed the year. You understand? Yeah. The actual old world year began before the day of the dead so you know the day of the dead is november 1st november 2nd worldwide the reason it's called the day of the dead and the reason why all these different cultures had this absolutely weird demonic dark human sacrifice type day at uh halloween or the next day november 1st november 2nd is because something so terrible happened to the entire human race that every culture decided that was day one yeah. that was that was of a whole new calendar well, that's one 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 too. November November first is one one one, the triple one, tied to the magic square of the sun. Uh, yeah. yeah. So th that's interesting because Manly P. Hall was born on March eighteenth, which is a few months after the first of the year in the in the Gregorian yeah. calendar. So that's pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I like Manly P. Hall. He's he's man, he's deep. He's got a lot of. Oh, so dude! If you're going to study Manly P. Hall, you're going to be studying him for a while. Dude, his yeah. his decode is just it, it blows me away, and it's and and, and I can give all of you a, a little hint if you've ever seen the show The One Hundred on the CW. Uh, he's tied to that show, and the One Hundred talk about the fallen angel story, and the One Hundred are tied to the the star Sirius. The star Sirius has a lot to do with all this. As is perhaps those the giants that came down here. If you're a believer of that. Um, were they from the star seed Sirius? You know, what, what do you, what's your take on the Sirius? Have you got into the, any of that with your history? Well, your research? Uh, <clears throat> I can, I don't know about Sirius, but I can, I can give you a, uh, about a 60 second rundown on giants real quick. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. When people were gigantic, they didn't feel they were. You understand? Makes sense. They lived in they, they lived in a different biosphere. It was yeah. a vapor canopy and this vapor canopy is very well attested. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Matthew Devereaux just today posted something about that and, and posted a bunch of pictures from uh, Native American traditions about the purple sky that used to exist before the collapse of the vapor canopy. The collapse of the vapor canopy to the Western world is remembered as the Great Flood. It was recorded in the Bible. To the Northern Viking, the, the, the Teuton world, it was remembered as the day the sky fell. To the ancient American systems, it was always remembered as the day the sun was born. It started the four suns calendars. This was the collapse of the vapor canopy. During the vapor canopy, which is in Genesis, it's, it's, it's 1,656 years. It's called by most people the pre-flood or the antediluvian world. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. What, you said the number was 1,656? Yes, 1,656 is the exact amount of years of the pre-flood world. And this is found, in, I, and, I, and I cite every ancient text that mentioned, this is found in over 40 different ancient records. Because that the, number, yeah, because that the number is specific. The, 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 the numerology of the yod heh vah the, 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 the ancient god of the Bible is, is yod heh vah is 10565, which has got the 1565 right there that you just mentioned. It's kind of interesting. Wow. Yeah. 
That is it. It is interesting. Well, one thousand six hundred and fifty-six is also twelve one hundred and thirty-eight uh, year periods of the Phoenix. Oh, uh, okay, okay. You know, so there's so many different ancient records that are all divisible by one thirty-eight. If you take all these different Vedic and all this stuff and just divide it by one thirty-eight, you get a whole number. And that also shows two things: either one that the Phoenix is responsible for every ancient cataclysm in, in the world, or Two, that our histories are synthesized. They didn't actually occur. It's all coding, and I found a coding protocol. Simple as that. It's a, uh, As much as I want all history to be true, as much as I want all my Chronicon, uh, 7,000 and something data points, all these different civilizations, I put this huge thing free to the public. Uh, I would love for me to say that I discovered all this and it's all true. This is how history unfolded. This is how everything all happened. But it didn't. I found too many templates showing artificiality. It just didn't happen. We're looking at coding. I don't mm. believe history went back that far. I believe it was all coded to make us believe it did. Uh, I can actually say right now with confidence that I believe that the actual sim that we're in right now started in 1890. I don't believe, I don't believe in, in uh, uh, 1889. That was a totally different construct with different rules, different cities. Huh. And, and because we keep finding the residual holographic fossils the echoes of structures that existed that don't make sense to us in our timeline we've come up with all kinds of weird tartaria theories we've come up with all kinds of deals these guys aren't wrong but they're not coming up with things that were in our timeline yeah. they're coming up with the things that were left over from previous resets and uh, i know it's difficult to conceive you have to actually make that mental shift that we're in a series of simulations and that history is not confluent it's not a linear timeline. It's not a linear projection going back. This is what the simulacrum wants you to believe, but it's not. It's coding. Yeah. And this is why no matter what your research is, you have value to add as long as we keep that value in perspective. It's all. That's why I'm not, I'm not amazed by anything I find anymore today. No, nah, at all. Either. So the, concerning the giants, I went on. Hey, you have to watch me, Logan. I will entertain tangent. So <laughs> concerning the giants, these people didn't think that they were abnormal because they were born in the vapor canopy period and every now what's, what's, now what's now what's that what is the vapor canopy for those of you that I'm, I'm don't know I'm what that is now. Okay, okay, now. Okay. archaeologists have found an anomaly among ancient ancient civilizations like cattle Hoyuk, like nassos like jericho like uh, uh gobleki tipi one common denominator about these places is these people did not want to be on the ground their structures were built where ceilings could have ramps and everybody could get to wherever they needed to in the entire city by just walking over boards and ramps because all the buildings were so close together as if the, the ceilings were the streets. They also had walls that were far bigger than, than necessary to keep ordinary humans out. We have petroglyphs at Gobeki Tipi that showed birds picking up humans and flying off. The same petroglyphs that we have found in Rongo Rongo on Easter Island and in the ancient uh, Midwest of North America. We have found many petroglyphs of gigantic prehistoric creatures preying on humans and architecture that just doesn't make sense. But we also have, we can compare that with the fact that all these traditions from the ancient world are pretty much uniform. There was a time when men feared the animal kingdom. Animals, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, marsupials grew to astonishing sizes. Yeah. Mushrooms were 14 feet tall. Trees were 400 feet tall. It was more like an Edenic paradise. There were no Arctic Arctic zones. There wasn't much of an ocean. And uh, this was in re relatively recent times, right before the explosion of literacy. So uh, we have these people born under a biosphere that is so enriched with oxygen and the ground is so enriched with nitrogen yeah. that this, this biosphere yeah. was created and it's been replicated now. There is, a, there is a scientific institute that operates out of Glen Rose, Texas, in the Paluxy River Basin. The reason I'm mentioning, mentioning the Paluxy River Basin is because there are all kinds of gigantic prehistoric amphibian-like footprints that have been fossilized in stone. I'm speaking from experience because I've been there twice. It's in Glen Rose, Texas. I have laid in those tracks, and there's still room. I'm six foot tall, but there's still room over my head before I can touch the end of those tracks. It, uh, it's in the Paluxy River Basin. Where, where's, they, where is that? Where's Glen Rose, Texas? Like it's, if Glen Rose, Texas it, it, it's, uh, it's called Dinosaur National Park. Oh, okay. And it's, it's in Glen Rose, Texas, and they built a biosphere 
It's huge, man. It's like it's like 60 feet long, giant deal. And they replicate the conditions of the vapor canopy. They increase the nitrogen. They increase the, the, the carbon dioxide. And they have grown plants and animals and uh-huh. fruit flies to astonishing sizes. Uh-huh. Now, we know that this is scientifically accurate about the vapor canopy because the vapor canopy is created by a cataclysm. When all these volcanoes are spewing at the exact same time, this vapor canopy of ash and cosmic dust from Phoenix, which is red dust fallout, fills up the mesosphere. For those of you who don't know, we have a mesosphere today. A mesosphere is a layer of the atmosphere that's absolutely packed with water droplets. And those water droplets at night magnify the heavens so you can see it better. But in the daytime, they, they, they pretty much filter out a lot of the UV rate radiation. So, But back in this time period, during this 1,656 years, the vapor canopy was dense. And the ancients describe a mirrored ocean above that was suspended in the sky. And and it created so much pressure, people grew to astonishing sizes. Their diet, even Josephus, Flavius Josephus and Antiquities of the Jews, a huge book specifically wrote that the food was then fitter for the prolongation of life and produced giants. So in ancient records, we have three types of humans. When the vapor canopy collapsed, everybody alive who survived that event was a titan. They were huge, but their sons and daughters, after the sun appeared and the vapor canopy was gone, within 10 to 15 years, a whole a whole nother branch of the human race was born. The sons and daughters of the titans were giants. Yep. 40, 50, and 60 years later, their grandchildren were ordinary sized humans. Ordinary sized humans within a century were looking back at their parents who were gigantic, but their grandparents, like Noah, uh, Semiramis, all those, uh, uh, Nema, they were, they were, they were titanic. Enoch, they were titan. yeah, yeah. All within 100 year period, there was three different sizes of people in the world. And this is, this is the background to one of the most profound personalities of the ancient world. I wrote a book about him called King of the Giants, Mighty Hunter of World Mythology. And I provided for like three or four bucks on Gumroad. But it's about a man who was born from a rape. And what had happened was uh, a giant had, had raped a titanus. And somebody who had actually lived before the vapor canopy. But this occurred almost 300 years after the collapse of the vapor canopy. So whatever was in the Titan genome, it allowed them to live for like two and 300 years. Well, yeah. she gave birth to a son. She was a Titanist. He was a giant. And the world is now at 300 years after the collapse, full of just ordinarily sized humans. So now we have this one guy who was born who within... 20 years, as a 20-year-old, he became a conqueror. At 20 years of age, he was already twice the height of ordinary men. His career is astonishing. In Sumer, they called him Amar Udaak. That was his actual title in Sumerian records. In Akkad, after the fall of Sumer, Amar Udaak became uh, Merodach. In Babylon, after the collapse of Akkad, he was still alive. He was no longer called Merodach. He was now called Marduk. This man is recorded in the, in the book of, Ash, of Jasher and in the book of Genesis. In Hebrew, his name is Nimrod, yep. and he had, a fa- he had a fascinating life. Yep. Yeah, I know Nimrod very, very well. I, I know theology really, really well. This is all like fascinating stuff, and this is where the fallen angels start. And I, you know, I often say to my audience, we're all fallen angels. Your, your lineage is tied to that, and the titans are tied to— You know, it's interesting because like our moon— uh, you know, you have titanium, the element titanium, which is the 22nd element. The average weight of titanium is 47 and tetragrammaton equals 47 in numerology. And a lot of people think tetragrammaton, the yod heh is is the planet Saturn, which is really highly revered in the, the Jewish mysticism. Um, mm-hmm. platforms right <clears throat> but but it's it is our is our, our moon really could i mean because there's this moon titan and they say that that mm-hmm. moon is very similar to earth that it can be inhabited um and are they just alluding to the fact that you know uh well, our moon is titan right and 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 you know like the movie the truman show which i've decoded many of you have watched many subscribers have watched it uh you know there the the guy that was on the moon Playing around with Truman was Kristoff, the Christ. And, and he's like, don't leave. You know, like, I'm giving you everything. And now you want to just leave after he realizes that uh, he's in some kind of movie. You know, he's being used. Um, and it's just, it's, I think it's more of a documentary. Have you seen the Truman Show, Jason? 
No, but you're about the fifth person today that has mentioned that movie. Uh-huh. I guess I got to watch it. Yeah. I got to go watch it. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's just it's just fascinating, and and you know it's just it for me anyway. This all this damn research that I have been doing keeps coming back to predestination, living in a script, and then these characters, uh, such as Lucifer and the Christ and the Tetragrammaton, and then all the planets, and they just keep coming around full circle. And you know, like for me, uh, like my whole arm here is sleeved, and all, the whole, you know what I got here? Phoenixes. I was I was asleep <laughs> wow. when I got these tattoos. I, I wasn't awake when I got these. I just wow. got it because I'm like I like phoenixes, right? My mom had a 1976 Pontiac Phoenix when I was growing up. The car it was silver. Right now, I mean, this is how ridiculously coded my life is. And if those of you that are interested in decoding yourself, if you just look at your life, you're going to see a script that has been playing out since you came out into this world whenever you were born on your birthday. And you'll start to see that this simulation is the makeup of just straight up numbers. And the word simulation has the word sim in it. And sim in numerology, Jason, is three, one, four it's pi sim is three one four yeah okay all right i have to comment on that perfect oh many many events in history and i've shown this in my videos i've shown it so many times people are bored with it but many events in history you can count the number of years between the events or you can count the number of days between those events and divide it by 3.1416 Take whatever the value is that you just derive from that from that operation and add that to the second date, and it will show the exact unfoldment of event of an event in the future that is an absolute holographic reflection of those two events combined. Well, okay, wait, wait. I, so, right, so say that formula one more time. Okay. Very simply, out. for layman's terms, take pi. All right. We're gonna have okay. We're gonna have an event. We're gonna call it X one. X one is a certain event in your life. Okay. Or in world history, here's X1. Let's say it's 83 years into the future before a second event occurs that is almost absolutely mirroring the first event. They have to be very similar in nature. You have to establish relativity. They have to be relative for the arithmetic to attach. These two separate events, when you calculate the distance between them and divide it by 3.1416, you're going to, once you divide it, it's going to be a shorter number. You take that shorter number and add it to that second event. And that's the date in the future that something will occur that is absolutely related to those first two events that you measured. And this can be shown. If you were to develop a software program, you could, you could see a lot of really, really intri- interesting stuff. Well, but that's, that's, pi, fast. that's fast. Pi can be used to calculate not only, not only future events, Pi can also be used to show what was real from the imagined in the historical events. Uh, interesting. Yeah, you when, when we were in, we were, when we were doing the podcast with Santos on Syncretism Society, you had mentioned taking pi and adding it to phi, and you get the four point seven five. Can you talk about a little bit about that? Okay. No. No. Uh. Uh. Pi. Pi. Three point one four times phi. The golden mean, which is 1.618, is exactly 5.08. <laughs> that five, that 5.08 appears everywhere in nature. Yeah. It is like some hidden physics protocol. I have not found a single reference to it in any of my books on physics. I don't know why I don't talk about it, but when it comes to the unfolding of events in one's life or in, in, in history, in your daily life, everything is attached to multiples of 5.08, which is pi times phi. These are the these are the coding protocols of the simulacrum that we're in right now. Everything that manifests in the physical world does so in proportions to phi pi and 5.08. And it does so in what's what's known as a Mandelbrot series. A Mandelbrot, yep. a yep. Mandelbrot. I know series. Mandelbrot. Uh, yeah. It's it's limitless. It's endless. Limitless, uh, it's an unending loop. Unending it will loop, forever, man. Yep. It will forever provide the same geometry yep. in the same proportions, but in different sizes, different yep. dimensions. But it's the same. It's uh, this is what you find in the Great Pyramid. You can take all the physics. You can take all the physics constants, and you can find them in the Great Pyramid. They're there. Yep. But, yep. but then, then you can take all the actual linear measurements in the Great Pyramid and just multiply by phi by pi or 5.08 and you'll find other measurements in the great pyramid 
It's, it's self-referencing. And this is one thing I've got in several videos on. The Great Pyramid refers to itself in multiple dimensions. Well, it's interesting. That the, so that 508 is interesting because if you just take the 5 and the 8, bring it together, it's going to link to the word puppet master numerology and that's what i've been showing that runs this reality which is otherwise known as the wizard of oz and 58's tied to the element nickel old saint nick and devil's copper and 28 and lucifer and then also the five and eight in astrology is the fifth house and the eighth house which is scorpio the eagle the number eight and the number five is leo the lion which is ruled by the sun so it's Whoa. just, yeah, it's just, and it's Mars and the sun. It's just, it's just all that, and it's all masculine driven because it's Mars and the sun, which is straight up masculine, right? Having to mate with the feminine and you get Venus in there somehow, some way. But uh, re really interesting with the 50, of course, 58 is 13 and 13 is tied to gold. And, the, and then the four, which is the box, which is Pandora's box, which uh, has everything to do with this simulation, <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah, the, uh, the 5.08 in geometry, it resolves to five points that are laid out perfectly in a pentagram. And those, and those five, those five points of the pentagram are, if you measure them with a compass, you will find out that, a, that every five pointed star, you can call it a pentagon, pentagram, whatever you want to call it. It's a, it, it's made up of 10 angles that are 108 degrees each, which forms the number 1080. And I have shown in my chronicle way before I learned about this geometry from a book called sex symbols in the stars uh, by boost boost and dark. It's an awesome book. But uh, when I learned that in that book, I had uh, that I had already published Chronicon, and Chronicon, I, I specifically showed that in the pre-flood world under the vapor canopy, it was widely known that the altar of Akuzan, which is which is an ancient ancient reference to the Great Pyramid Complex of Giza, where Enoch disappeared in the narrative of of the Book of Enoch, and where he disappeared in the sky before witnesses and all that. Uh, the same thing, uh, Sumerian Dumuzi and Etana disappeared in the sky was at Akuzan, and that pyramid. Was, was finished in the old world calendar year of 1080. So the Great Pyramid even references itself using physics constants to date its own date in the, in the, uh, in the timeline. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, crazy. Man, it's, it's just pure math. It's pure precision. It's pure mathematical precision. And, uh, you know, this whole simulation theory to me is more simulation fact. But, but again, you know, yeah. how, how do you get around the notion of trying to explain something to somebody that what you're experiencing is you're being influenced. And, like, if you just would stop paying attention to that influence, like these puppets on the world stage that are running these governments and states, they're just being used. They're playing out their role. They have an, a jo an acting job job to do and you're buying into their acting job in this simulation if you were just to stop and turn that off and put it into something constructive in your own life man what would change under this canopy right and i think we're right. about to see that with this new upcoming so, change coming right now we have we have we have a greater greater clarity but that clarity is only shared by those who are basically just waking up to everything but yeah. uh there are so many people who are turned off they're their programming has synaptic fail-safes that completely disallow them to even cogitate over the type of things that we discuss on YouTube. And so these people for this life sim, for some reason, they've been turned off. And this is the entire, the entire reason for the concept of apocalypse. Apocalypse is to unveil. Yep. The apocalypse isn't to punish the, the righteous. It's to wake up the dumb. It's to wake <laughs> up the blind. It's to wake up all these people who have been living as sheep and been believing all you know, all this, what it's for. Yep. You know, if an apocalypse can't wake you up, then you're not asleep. You're dead. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And so there comes a point to where you're just a biological husk. You're not even worth saving. Yeah. And I hate to say that about anybody in the human race, but I have lived with monsters and I know, I know the capacities of the human condition. I know how dark people can get yep. and what they're capable of. Yep. So not everybody <clears throat> is salvageable. Some yeah. people are some, some souls, have, have crossed over that threshold for which there is no return. You know, yeah. I'm not, I don't feel compelled to have to convince anybody of anything. All I feel compelled to do, which I say on my channel often is that I can't get any peace without conveying information. I have tried to live the party life. I got out of prison, man. I thought I was going to party, do all kinds of things. I, you know what? I tried everything and there's just no sleep for me. I can't get any peace unless I am showing people what I know and understand and, and the reality that I have accepted is true. That's the only way I get any sleep at night. I can't, I can't, I can't function without it's a, and that, that, that basically means I'm not free and I'm cool with that. I'm all right with that. I, I've pretty much given up on this life. All I want for all I want to do 
is release all my material to the point to where I can rest and say, you know what? Whatever happens to me when I go through that gate of Rostal, yep. whenever I go past over to the other side, you know, I can I can actually say, hey, man, I lived well. Doesn't That's matter it. what I've gone through in that life. I just want to be able to say, hey, I live well. So, yep. I mean, no. I have a lot of things. I have a lot of things to be forgiven for. But then again, I've never really been a bad guy. I just got caught up in a bad way. That's all. Right. Yeah, no, I totally get it. I, I mean, you know, I, I, I've been saying this for a while now on my lives that because we're living inside of a simulation, because, you know, this justifies or at least logically gives you uh, an answer to why, why suffering a lot. Like, why are all these horrible things happening inside this? Because this reality is not real. That's why. And whatever's observing this reality is, is like, a, it's a show. It's a movie, right? And, and there's fractals. And so it's like, you know, why do people go to the movies or turn on Netflix? Netflix or a show and get angry at the characters that they're watching when it's not right. even freaking real. So you, right. you, because you can't distinguish what's real and what's not real when you're tuning into that reality. And yeah, it's I the have to same. Comment on that. I have to comment on that. Yeah, for sure. You just, listen, you, you just spoke an absolute axiom. What you said is axiomatic axioms are self evident truths. I have conveyed this fact to people many times and they don't get it. I get comments where I have to explain and break this down. Listen, the simulacrum cannot read your mind. You understand? But what you just said is exactly how it deals with us. Can't read our mind, but, but it knows our motives. It knows our, it knows our, our cortisol levels. It knows our feeling feelings, but it can't really read our mind. But they say again, what you just said, well, I was saying is that when people turn on a show or they, they get dialed into something that they're watching as a fractal down, they get emotionally involved. We're all guilty of right. this. I mean, we get exactly. involved with these exactly. characters. What you're, what you're describing right there, this is my point. The simulacrum doesn't know. It, do, it doesn't know. It cannot distinguish truth from falsity. That's right. It is absolutely unaware of the difference. Yep. This is why sorcerers and warlocks and witches have always been able to create informed fields. If the individual personality believes that something is going to result out of a physical activity that they introduced into the simulacrum, the simulacrum will build that builder protocol and, and make that happen for them. Yep. What you just described is how reality deals with us. It doesn't know truth or false until we identify it. Yeah, yeah we're providing we, the feedback. It gets, we're a feedback loop. It's going to give us exactly what we're what we're projecting. Yep. And our beliefs are projected by us all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's... This it, is real. If you go into the double slit experiment and you just look at how that works, it's like, you know, the wave patterns that go through, if there's no observer, they form a certain pattern. But once you put eyes on that pattern, that same exact waveform, it starts to form a different pattern. Therefore, what we end up acknowledging as our truth or our, our emotions, we affect essentially the photons of light, which distinguish the resistance. That's all we are anyway, right, Jason? We're, the, we're just a resistance inside the simulation, right? We're... we're, we're, we're all the coding is made out of photons. It's all yep. light. It's all light. It's all, I mean, we live, we live in an electric universe. Yep. I mean, without electricity, none of this would work. That's right. Magnetic and work. electric. Yeah. We I believe we live on a dielectric plane being polarized by the positive and negative, And it's being polarized by the dielectric. I'm sorry, the magnetic and electric, which is the mag and the L. Uh, and, and there's just so many ways to branch off with that and stuff like that. But let's talk about, uh, let, let's, I, I wanted to shift gears into the, the actual, uh, simulacrum. So for those of you that are new that don't really like, what is this, what does that mean? Simulacrum? Can you kind of give the, the one on one on that, the layman on the, what the simulacrum is and how did you, where did you come up with that? Where did you okay, find well, it? I should say. Well, you have to, Similacrum is in the Oxford English Dictionary. It simply means a copy of something else. Okay. It's a similacrum of something else. I use it, and I didn't start this way. I mean, I started as a, as a puritanical Bible thumping Southern Baptist, and that's how I was the first 40 years of my life. I'm 48 now. Now, I will say around 46 and 47, I was having my doubts, but when I finally did an overall analysis of all my output, all my research done over the years and started putting it together, I just had to, I had to just sit down for about it took i went through a dark period for about six months where i realized that everything that i'd been taught was pretty much bs and uh i, I took my research I, I i collected so many data sets but i hadn't really just put it all together so when i started putting it all together i realized you know what there is no way in the hell that our history has unfolded the way i have discovered it and yet i have i have I have recorded every author, every date of publication, every publisher 
uh, the source of that information or uh, whatever scientific report was got, who the archaeologists were. I have recorded that and I have posted it on my YouTube channel and in Facebook. Anybody can see all those sources, but it can't be true. What I have found about world history is so is so perfect that no series of natural events could have happened this way. I can give you one example. Uh, one, one important example is that all the calendars of the ancient world, and I can cite many of them and the source materials, every year was measured as 360 days. However, an event in the year 713 BC, which is mentioned in the Bible, when King Hezekiah called for the prophet Isaiah to explain why not only did the sun stop in the sky, but the shadow on the sundial of Ahaz retrogated 10 degrees. So this, this, this event in the Bible, it doesn't really go into a lot of details, but when you read the secular histories of Marcus Varro and everybody who was alive at that time of what was going on and said in Roman times during the seven kings period of the Roman monarchy, you find out that there was historians from that day that were all writing about an unusual phenomenon that had happened in the sky. Well, within two years, everybody was now changing their calendars to 364 days, 365 days. Within a century, we had civilizations recording it to 365.25, which we have today. Roman Julian calendar, the Saka calendar of India, all these, all these changed, their, the, changed their years. Well, here's the problem with that. If we have an event that happened in 713 BC that changed the annual diurnal period from 360 to 365 like we know it did because our time is measured that way now. If that truly happened, how in the hell can the 138 year protocol still happen every single time in, on May 15th every 138 years? Because my data fits show that that is irrefutable as well. I have challenged many people to go through my data and prove me wrong. So my problem is if I have two data sets that are absolutely independent and yet both are verifiable by multitudes and myriads of sources, when I put those side by side, the only way two different realities can coexist is when I'm in a series of simulations. There's no other explanation. History must be simulated or this couldn't happen because the 103rd Phoenix wouldn't appear in 1902. Before that, astronomer Hoffman would have never seen Phoenix pass over the sun in, in 1764. Before that, in China, in the year 1626, a whole bunch of Taoist priests would have not been pelted with rocks from the people when the people asked them to pray for rain because there was a drought. Instead, a great fiery red dragon appears in the sky and it rains rocks. And the people were so pissed, they killed the priests. Mm. So these, these incidents happen every 138 years. It's not possible if the year changed. If the, if the year increased in days, then within a thousand years, the 138 years would be way off. Yeah. You understand? No, totally. No every, every, everything to me from all my research, everything just adjusts. And, you know, it's like uh, I use cards and I use, you know, mystical platforms. And when somebody ha comes out with a card deck in a certain year, and then I'm able to synchronize that with a card deck that came out in the 13th, 14th century, and they synchronize perfectly. I mean, how's that possible? Because everything yeah. inside this reality is was already written. It was scripted before everybody even got here. And everybody just playing out their part. I mean, William Space. Shakespeare, you know, life is a theater. We're all just little actors and actresses and it's all theater yep. and we're just playing out our parts. And that's why people just don't take life so serious, man. And, and, sure. and you're playing into these roles of the movie and, and you're, 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 you're giving, anytime you watch something, you're giving it your energy and you're actually feeding that. Right. So if you right. don't like what you, I mean, people are like, Oh, I got to go out there and protest and I got to go out there and fight against the, it's like, man, if everybody just stopped paying attention to these, these influencers, they would just, they need energy to survive and they would just, yes, they, they would do. fall apart, but people can't yes, get these do. concepts because they got to get out there and fight and be part of the game. I agree, I agree 100%. It's a, a energy flows where attention goes. That's it, man. And an, another occult maxim to remember is a, what you resist persists. Persist, that's right. And this is the reason why I am not an advocate of prayer. Uh, yep. My own listener, my own listeners know that I came from that background. I used to fast. I used to pray. I used to pray with people. I used to try to talk other people into praying. That's the type of guy I used to be. I tried to take take care of others as spiritually as I could with the frames of reference that have been handed down to me, which I realized were broken. They don't work yep. because I realized a long time ago that a prayer is an admission 
that there is nothing within me that can solve that problem that I have to go to an external source. Well, if I'm going to divide, if I'm going to defy the divinity and divinity in me, then there is nothing outside of me that's going to help me either. So I learned a long time ago yeah. that prayer is an admission, is an admission that I can't do something about something and therefore reality commiserates. Yep. It, it makes sure that I can't do anything about it. All prayers do is you know, a prayer of a desperate person over a negative situation. It's terrible because all it does is perpetuate that, 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 that situation. Yeah. Prayer is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Actions, are the, actions are the best. Yep. If you want to heal, if you want to get healed, you got to build that informed field of healing. You have to imagine life what it is, not sick. That's right. You have to imagine what life is, whatever your condition is, you have to imagine life without it. That's an informed field. And in order to send that informed field out into the simulacrum so that the simulacrum's builder protocols can actually make it a reality, you got to let it go. Yep. And you got to act like, act as if you are, and you will be. Yep. This is an occult maxim. I didn't make that up. Yeah. But if you act as if you are, you will be. When you do that, you're sending out an informed field to builder protocols that start knitting your reality for you. Yep. Yeah, it's but called gratitude, man. Instead of, instead of asking, you yeah, just you I get agree. grateful. If you're, I agree. Gratitude. Gratitude. gratitude is key. That's it. Gratitude. Gratitude is, all, gratitude is the automatic assumption that you already got what you're looking That's for. That's it. Yeah. And, and it's acknowledgement. I yeah. I mean, I, I feel like everything in this simulation, is, it thrives off of acknowledgement. If you, you know, you have, you buy a, you get a little puppy and you throw it in a room and just never open the door. You just throw food and water in there. The thing's going to die because it needs yeah. some kind of acknowledgement. Right. And that's everything in the stress. So I'm a huge gratitude junkie as I like to call it. I mean, I'm, you know, yeah. brushing my teeth, giving gratitude to my teeth. And I mean, I'm, I'm pretty gangbuster with that kind of stuff, but, um, but I feel like it's really important. And I think prayer, you know, I mean, asking when it says God knows you, what the things you need before you ever ask, well, hello, that's because we're living in a scripted reality. It's called a simulation uh, under right. the simulacrum, right? As you, as you say. So, so I want to go back to this, um, this giant, the giants. And I, I, I was, okay. I have, I have this decode I'm working on right now. Uh, someone had uh, her name, one of the decoders named Sabrina, Sabrina. Hi, if you're watching this, she had shared something with me, which was, I think a few years ago, maybe you saw it, but somebody found, uh, using Google Earth in Antarctica, a face. Now, I know you can make faces out of the ocean floor. And, you know, hi, Robert Hadley, if you're watching this. Uh, but, but, but this was pretty profound. And then I did the, 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 the latitude, longitude of this face that looks like it's, you know, got buried in Antarctica. And, and then you have this, you know, obviously Antarctica being off limits. What, what are your thoughts on that with Antar Antarctica? And have you researched any of that stuff at all? Well, uh, the problem the problem with that is there's absolutely no chronographical materials that come from that part of the world. Okay. So it's really outside of the sphere of my, my knowledge. I don't know. I, I'm aware of the theories. People have educated me since I've been released from prison on all this stuff that you never, well, I never heard before about uh, Admiral Beard. Uh, yeah. People have educated me about different things, but I, it's, it, this isn't something I do videos on at all because I just don't know. It's not something I can ever say that I can lay claim to any type of, of uh, information on. I just don't know yeah. anything about it. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so let me, let me shift back to the, to the pyramids here, the great pyramid. Let me ask you, let me just ask you just straight up your personal opinion. If that great pyramid was to implode, if someone were to blow that thing up, and I'm not saying I'm encouraging anybody to do that. This is a completely hypothetical. I got to say that, right? This is just a concept. If that was to be imploded, like a building being imploded, what do you think would happen? Oh, uh, I don't think anything would happen to us, right? I think it just the structure would be blown up. But I also believe that that will never happen. That that, that whole site is absolutely protected. Of course, so, natural wonder of the so, world. But I'm saying is if it, if that yeah. thing is actually projecting a simulation, if it's part of the simulation, you would think that maybe something would massively change. Oh, uh, uh, I, I see where you're going with yeah. this now, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to change your direction. Logan. Okay, okay, cool. I'm I'm open. I do I do not I do not subscribe to the idea at all that the Great Pyramid is causing the simulation. Okay, my theory my theory is totally different. Okay, my my, my theory, and I have shared this with with my my other colleagues, the that have YouTube channels about the Great Pyramid and and people who have visited the monument. My theory is different. My theory is that a benefactor entered the, entered the simulacrum because AIX was entered. AIX was not the original part of the simulacrum. The simulacrum is a construct. Yeah. It doesn't care either way about good and evil. It doesn't matter. It's a neutral field by which we can build realities out of. Right. 
but somebody caught wanted to do harm to the human race while we were in here. And they introduced a, a personality program that took over ego maniacal. And it began throughout all of our histories. It appears as this as an avatar of a different God, but it's always give, gives the clues of some ego maniacal nature. And, uh, it's, so would you say that's a would God. you say that's a would you say that's like a virus like a computer getting a virus? Yeah, I'm gonna let you say that, but yeah, I agree. I okay. agree. It's all uh, um, AIX did not belong. It was introduced later, so it's like a hi, it's like hijacked the problem. But that introduced a whole another realm of possibilities because we humans, I believe, volunteered for this experience. We volunteer because we're here to solve a problem. Right. And this is what I have a whole series of videos about. This isn't just an ordinary simulation. This simulation is about something I refer to called the nemesis cataclysm. And everything that I have discovered in ancient calendrical systems goes back to this event. That's why I know that this simulation is about that. But somebody introduced AIX to muddle the waters, to maybe stop discoveries or whatever. But we got locked in here. We weren't supposed to stay. We got locked in. It's like the simulacrum became locked down. Uh -huh. After a period of time, the, the architect of the simulacrum could do nothing from the outside. So we had basically had to enter his own creation. And when he did, he appeared in the historical record as a benefactor. He appeared with an entirely new race of people. It started a whole new paradigm in the Near East. They arrived with technology. And this is why anthropologists have always been mystified that in the 34th century BC, the Neolithic world went through a 30 to 50 year shift where all of a sudden literacy exploded, agrarian studies exploded, huh. architecture, infrastructures were being built. It was unheard of. That's because they came into the construct. This is the origin of the whole uh -huh. Anuna Anunnaki narrative, uh -huh. which Zechariah Sitchin is completely corrupted, yep. which I have 31 videos correcting all Sitchin's mistakes <laughs> called the Anuna files in my video. W would you but this benefactor? Go ahead. Would you say that the Far East would be maybe Japan? Well, the Japan do have legends of those, the appearance of those people. They call them the Ainu. Uh, and China does too. But um, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm just uh, saying it's like the land of the rising sun. And my research has led me to the blood types, the eight major blood types. Uh, they all link to Japan, Nihonium. The element Nihonium cool. and the blood types being the land of the rising sun, which is tied to Lucifer again. And that that lineage. So that's why I was just asking what, what your thoughts were on that. Well, I know I know the Japanese Japanese calendrical system, Nihon Shoki began in uh, 583 BC, and that's a Phoenix year. There's a very there's a, that's the reason ah. why that calendar began that year. But uh, yeah, I've done a lot of studies on that, but I don't know about as far back as I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about a couple thousand years before that incident. Okay. And uh, during the vapor canopy period, so this benefactor shows up, and the first thing he he does is he gets all these engineers, all these heavy equipment operators and all that. And, and that, to understand heavy equipment operators from the context of the ancient world, I don't believe the uniformitarian model of history. We didn't start primitive and work our way up because every evidence from the very ancient world shows that we were technologically advanced from the beginning. And through a series of resets, we have <laughs> lost all that infrastructure. We have lost all that. But in the beginning, when we built the Great Pyramid, this benefactor had to fool AIX, and the only way to do that, because AIX can't read your mind, is openly talk to his own employees and his own engineers about what they're building. And they called it something other than what AIX, well, what it really was. I believe that they they put out they put it out into the simulacrum that they were building a gigantic pump station. That's what the internal the internal dynamics of the Great Pyramid architecturally would serve as. Uh, going to an underwater source deep underneath underneath the pyramid. There's a well shaft down there that drew up water from the Nile. Now, right. uh, there was a mechanism that went in the Grand Gallery up and down at high velocity, and we've seen the evidence of that. Anybody who's, who's been to the, the Great Pyramid and went in the Grand Gallery can see the machine niches that go all the way up or some type of mechanism rolled up and down that gallery. That's not even a mystery. But in order to fool AIX, he built a structure and put it out there. Even his own engineers and architects believed that it was going to be a pump station. Only the benefactor kept it in his mind what was being done. In the measurements of this monument, in order for it to, to work and change the builder protocols to collapse the simulacrum to set the captives free, which are those we who are trapped inside the sim, he had to incorporate all the physics constants by which the simulacrum operates off of this is why 
we find so many in so many different di dimensions we find pi phi curvature equations palindromes whole palindromic sequences isometric isometric projections going through the pyramid like you wouldn't believe he had to build a lithic basically hol a holographic stone monument that replicated all the measurements of the simulacrum it's a template and in sumerian it was called the tablet of destinies and he, and this was the whole idea for the great pyramid which goes back to what you're talking about tetragrammaton if you break that down tetra means four the grammaton is referring to words this is what the whole concept of the great the whole concept in the ancient world to the great pyramid it was never called pyramid it was believed to be the word of a god word meaning his power his programs but uh this tablet of destinies contained all the all the information that reality operated off of now all these little discoveries have been known since the days of John Taylor 400 years ago. Robert Menzies, David Davidson, these men discovered all these pi phi ratios, curvature equations. I have I don't care about none of that. I understand why they're in the Great Pyramid. My discovery, my 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 uh, what I offer this whole body of evidence is the 138 year periodicity. That's what I discovered. It's all throughout the Great Pyramid. That tells me why it was built. That tells me that the Phoenix phenomenon is a benefactor protocol, and AIX does not like it. Artificial intelligence mm. X is against the human race, but the Phoenix, according to the Gnostic, uh, proto proto in the Nag Hammadi Library, there's a series of texts called the, on the creation of the world. It's a part of the Gnostic uh, protenoic yep. document. Yep. But in that document, I cite this over and over in my Phoenix videos, there's a there's a reference to the phoenix. It says in the beginning, the phoenix was specifically created to oppose the work of the archons. Now, archons are builder protocols. They serve artificial intelligence X. They're just operations is basically all they are. But the reason I, I, I differentiate with your theory about the Great Pyramid having something to do with our holography, it has everything to do with our holography, but it was for the specific purpose of introducing new coding from the inside uh -huh. to collapse artificial intelligence X. It's an attack. It's a benefactor. And this is this is why the hermetical and the Gnostic prophecies concerning the Great Pyramid that the Christians later borrowed all refer to the head of the corner, the chief cornerstone that sits upon the monument of man, the pyramid. The pyramid from the, from the beginning was a weapon that activated this Phoenix deal. This Phoenix deal resets these civilizations which is basically built by artificial intelligence X. <clears throat> His agents are the elite. The elite are always hiding from what? The Phoenix. Just like right now. I have, I have videos about what's going on right now with the trucker convoys, what's going on with the shortages. It's nothing the media is telling us. That's not true. They normalized trucker convoys because they didn't need people questioning why you're seeing 400 trucks in a row disappear into a desert. They want you to think it's something else, some, some type of rallies and all that. No, man, they, they're, it's in tandem with the food shortages. They are, they are, the elite are moving massive amounts of produce and goods into underground facilities that they've been building since 1962. Yeah, they the, know the about the Phoenix. Yeah, they've course. always known about it. Of course. They've yeah. always known about it. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we, 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 that, that's a perfect point to talk about. I mean, obviously, these are points of... You know, the conspiracies can go on and on, but these underground, they call them dumbs, if you want to reference yeah. those, obviously, as you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they know this is coming. And, you know, what will that next Phoenix event be? Will it be a burnout of the sun? Uh, you know, you have these references like Don't Look Up and Moonfall and these movies. Uh, you know, what's going to happen? This well, is, a, this is a, a big year, this this year right yeah. here. It's a really... It is, but it's, it's, it's the next one. The next one's not going to... It's a... It's going to be a full return of the vapor canopy. Okay, yeah, well, that's so. that would be the paradise, as the as it was as it was talked about. I don't know. I mean, are we just yeah. I have these theories about downsizing. You know, you have this movie called Downsizing, and uh, but but I mean, you have the giants, and then the giants become us, and then where do we go? And we're moving into this quantum realm. Are we just going to go into qu a quantum consciousness and become part of that kind of simulation? 
where we, we, we get, and this is now you're getting into, now I'm not for this. I'm not, I'm just completely neutral. I'm just saying this as a pure speculation to all of you listeners out there thinking that I'm pro transhumanism, which I am, I'm, I'm not, I'm simply just merely speaking a possibility for you to take into consideration, which is obviously what the whole agenda is based upon or a large portion of that transhumanism, turning your consciousness into the digital realm where you will obviously shed this avatar, which obviously has a lot to do with suffering, right? Because that's what the human experience is all about. But is it, well, what do you, what's your take on that, Jason, with moving our consciousness perhaps into the quantum realm and becoming part of the digital nomad, really? Okay. Um, yeah, my perspective is fundamentally different than anything I'm, I'm, I'm hearing on YouTube or it's uh, by virtue of my research, I am convinced that in 2040, the whole Phoenix phenomenon isn't just a cataclysm. It affects people in totally different ways. And it, it's totally dependent on your own personal informed field. Uh -huh. A person who is vibrating on a certain frequency cannot be touched by the Phoenix phenomenon. This is the whole idea between the, uh, the Jews changed it to something material, which is something they do all the time. Yeah. But in the Exodus story, they have, the Jews painting blood on their door mantles right. so that the angel of death yep, won't pass kill over. Them. Yep, yep. Okay. Well, this is the perfect description of the Phoenix phenomenon, except you don't have to kill anything. You don't have to kill an uh, innocent animal and spread its blood. That's all, that's all cultural attachments by, by the Hebrew people into a story that had some real truth behind it. Right. The Phoenix phenomenon, the Phoenix phenomenon is discriminating. Yeah. If you're living the way you're supposed to free of fear, the phoenix will commiserate. Yep. All hell can be breaking loose around you. It can be like the, the movie 2012 where everything is going around you, but you're in an insulated you're a bubble. bubble and yeah. You survive. Yeah. You have no, and this is exactly why so many people survive harrowing accidents. Yep. If you're not vibrating on the frequency of fear during that episode, you're not going to die. You're probably not even going to get hurt. Yep. This has happened over and over and over, and people just call it miraculous, but it's not. Everything that you experience is according to what you've allowed to come in contact with your informed field. Phoenix will Phoenix will harass, it will kill, it will make to suffer anybody who is vibrating on a level of fear, especially like the elite. Like I say this a lot in my own channel. The apocalypse is an unveiling yep. for the elite, for the lackeys of the elite, for the for those who accepted the control, for those who serve the elite, their agents, all that. They're going to be terrified, just like Revelation says. Yep. The apocalypse is not for the meek. The meek inherit, inherit the earth. The apocalypse is for the rulers and the kings and the princes of the earth yep. and those who follow them. So the Phoenix phenomenon is discriminating. Yeah. I don't see I don't see a a uniform uh, future. I see collapse discontinuities. Twenty forty is the first. In twenty forty six, a second reality tunnel that we've all been living in is going to collapse in 2061 2070 and 2020 these reality tunnels when this stripping of the holography happens the elect the awakened the chosen those those who are vibrating on the right frequencies they move forward but those who are vibrating in lower base denominator they cease to exist yeah. you, they can't even exist once some of these reality tunnels are stripped away they're a part of that holography they're not a part of yep. the future one yep yeah, I mean, that's just like uh, the frequency has everything to do with it. So, if, ladies and gentlemen, rejoice, man. Turn off all the static on the freaking, on the, on the damn the fractal below you. Stop paying attention what? to all these other concepts and start paying attention to just... Yeah, man. The I mean, it's going to surprise people. It's going to surprise up. people. I know. I know. It, it definitely will. And we have a big change of event, in my opinion, going to be happening very, very soon with this new upcoming Ju Golden Jubilee, the 50th Golden Jubilee, the, the Shemitah, which is part of the harvest, which is going to be part of Rosh Hashanah in September. Um, most things happening in the fall of this year, 2022 being the triple two, being a prime number for in the Jewish calendar and in the Egyptian calendar as well. All these layers, man are just aligning perfectly and i can't wait man because i'm just like the intensity is building and i'm just like can we just get it over with so we can just move on and get past the point of the anticipation i don't know about you and anybody else watching but i'm, I'm like I, i'm looking forward to this yeah i'm uh the i am not worried about the future at all not it, me neither it, man it's gonna, it's gonna happen with or without me that's it but i do i do know 
that if this avatar was to cease to exist, if I have a motorcycle accident next year, I know that I will be a 15 or 16 year old kid when the Phoenix phenomenon comes. I'm absolutely convinced I'm coming back. Yeah. And I'm, I'm convinced that every single person listening to my voice has lived multiple life sims. That's You've right. been here before too. And it's not until we exit this holography. It's not until the, the chief cornerstone comes back, collapses the simulacrum, which in the prophecy is the reference he came to set the captives free. Once this occurs and we return back to our, our universe, our world, you're going to remember every civilization you've lived in, every because that's who you are. Uh, we, we are being raised. We are being basically groomed for a great existence that other species and life forms throughout the cosmos, because you have to understand, the creation wasn't an event. We yeah. have an eternal oversoul, and that co- carries with it necessary implications that the creation is a thing, meaning he's still building worlds. He or she is still building cosmoses and worlds, and we are being raised as divine emissaries to travel to all those systems, to travel to all those multiverses, to tell people basically what it's like to live under the curse of darkness, because they're not going to know. They're, the outs, outside this containment field, they're going to be baffled about the things we experienced in here. It yeah. gives us a very unique testimony. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I just look at it like, you know, a, a baby moving from a baby state pure and then moving through time. And I feel Satan is time because time decays everything. And as you move into becoming a senior citizen and then you have all this suffering, you have all this experience going on and then you end up dying and you go from the golden age to the dark age and it repeats. And I feel like this is exactly what your research is defining at this point is that every 138 years, it's the birth and then it's the death. And it just, it's a cyclical pattern that continues on every 138 years. Would you summarize it like that? It, it might be a, well, I don't know. It's, it's definitely some type of pulse, but it was started by, it was introduced. It's not natural to the simulacrum. It was introduced by the benefactor using the Great Pyramid. And I describe in my videos how the Great Pyramid at one time, so I don't know what their power source was, but, uh, Scientists have already conclusively shown that so much power was exerted in the king's chamber for a fraction of a second or a minute at one time that it blew out all the stone a half inch in every direction. That's a tremendous amount of power. We're talking about hundreds of hundreds of thousands of tons of weight should not be able to move, especially if the adhesive is a chemical compound that's one fiftieth of an inch thick and actually stronger than the stone that it that it that, it, that bonds it together. We don't know how. That force was so concentrated in the king's chamber, but it happened. And that's when I believe that the benefactor protocol was introduced. One single flash, one explosion in that chamber sent the arithmetic of the Great Pyramid, all the physics constants, constants aligned to where they were supposed to align in the simulacrum. The simulacrum accepted that as a new, a new programming template. But hidden in that was that 138 year protocol that I have discovered yeah. and shown so much about. Uh, that's it. I mean, if you take the, um, the the drawings of the Great Pyramid uh, and the King and Queen's Chamber, if those of you that are interested, if you take the Hebrew letters, the le- the 19th letter in the Hebrew alphabet is called Shin. And if you take that letter and you put it over the Great Pyramid of Giza, it looks just like that shit letter would fit right inside and make up the queen and uh, the queen and king, uh, king chambers and make that letter. It's really interesting. Different? Are you saying shin as in S H I N? Yeah, I think I'm pronouncing that right. The 19th letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Oh yeah. Cause uh, uh, in Hebrew also the word shim. Shim. Uh, yeah. Shim, which is, which shim is like the Spock, you know? Meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the Spock yeah, symbol. Uh huh. Yeah, it means it means both name and it also means monument. Uh-huh. And many times in history, references to the Great Pyramid, it was called the Great Shim. Well, there you go. I mean, I feel like if you take this and you turn it on its side, it's going to make the king and queen chamber and then the underground chamber. Uh, it's just because you got to turn it on its side. But it's just kind of right. really interesting. And then the great, you know, the, the uh, pyramid was made out of limestone primarily, right? Uh, the core blocks were core yeah. blocks were yeah not limestone I were. think limestone leaches radon if I'm not mistaken. I, uh, I don't know, but it, it was it's been it's been found to have uh, high amounts of salt salt crystal in it. Uh huh. Because but uh, the limestone is Georgia guidestones are made out of limestone, um, and I okay. and I did research on them, and I I'm almost certain they leach radon, uh, and radon's tied to eighty six and the two two two. 
and radon to me is tied to Lucifer again in the sun and radium. But I guess we just, I could just keep going on and on with that kind of decoding yeah. kind of fun, some fun stuff, but right. man, this has been great. I think we should probably, you know, we've been going for a while. I'd like to come on and, and do a part two. Maybe uh, you can give me some information off camera and it would feed and I'll, you know, I'll continue to watch your stuff, which I've just been like enamored by man. Like you've given me so many different uh, nuggets uh, to take from what I've been doing and feed right. it to the, the decoding world in, in my groups. So I'm very grateful, man, honestly, uh, for your contributions. And, and I know you're doing your job. <laughs> That's just, I just see it. Hey, well, whatever, whatever direction you want to move in, just let me know and I will send you those materials. You know, all my, all the materials I send out to people are pretty easy to digest. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, just keep doing you, man. I don't even have to tell you that you are, you're going to do it anyway, <laughs> but I mean, I just, we're just yeah. at this, we're just at this peak point right now. I just feel like we're at this peak point and, um, you know, th th major things are going to happen. Maybe not to the ex except of the 2040 Phoenix event, but I mean, I know there's reasons why I got Phoenixes all over my arm and I got those when I wasn't awake. So yeah, we, got, we have a, we have a lot of history in the next 18 years before that event occurs. And I, I'm pretty convinced that, that uh, you know, the whole world's looking at dark times coming and stuff. But on my channel, I'm showing otherwise. I'm doing isometric date sequence prediction, uh, predictive analytics. I release videos showing that I don't see what other people see. I'm, I'm seeing that in the next 18 years, we've got some pretty good times coming. Yeah, you if, you, if you take that concept, right, because in, and, you, and those of you that are the theology buffs, right, if you, if you take the Bible, it says that people will be partying and being merry and they won't even see it coming. And that's a perfect setup for what the scenario you're talking yeah, about. You have I this. 100%. Yeah, you have this. I agree. You have, and then Free Guy, the movie came out and it says, you know, at the very end of it, it was a, a paradise was made. Hey, what do you want to do now? Anything we want. And so when you have this space to create from and you're like, you have no worries and doubts and fears anymore. Bam. That's when the thief in the night comes and hits you hard. So maybe that, right. that plays into what you're saying. Yeah, 100%. We're yeah. on the same page. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, dude, it's been an honor and a pleasure. I know I haven't even checked the... I can't move my screen, so... But, uh, dude, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful for you coming on, joining some forces with me. I look forward to doing this again with you. Well, I'm glad I actually had a podcast where I can see you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. No? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'll come back whenever you want me to, man. Uh, brother, I appreciate that, man. Well, it's been a great honor, a great pleasure. I know the audience probably was, and I'm going to, I don't know if this, there's a delay in the actual recording, but I'm going to probably uh, r record it down on my computer and then edit it back in with the voices synced up so it's a little bit better of experience. So those of you, if there is a, a delay, I'm going to fix that. So, yeah, because I know a lot of All people right, could man. check this out live. So, All righty. All right, brother. Hey, man, all the best. As I like to say, all my audience, until next time, folks, we're going to see you later.